Now, coming to a conclusion, some of the sub supplementary aspects of Islamic education. One is, as much as possible, we need an Islamic setting. You need to have an Islamic setting. And you need to try to set things around you, um, you know, to start to appreciate some of the Islamic, um, you know, even in, in designs and clothing, in, in your food, you know, and whatnot. You need to go into your culture. Uh, you know, <clears throat> our children are in great need of culture. Because our culture now is becoming the, the Dajjalic culture of the West. Even in Mecca and Medina, they have Pizza Hut, McDonald's. You know, it's all over the place. So we need to get them to appreciate other parts of Islam. You know, in many Muslim countries, for a hobby, Muslims used to do calligraphy, khat. And they learned how to do the khat, very beautiful. Now it's basketball, right, baseball. Okay, it, it's good for, to be a, you know, athletic, right? But if that's your main hobby in life, you want to be Michael Jordan, you got a problem. Because only one in a billion are going to be like Michael Jordan in this society. And a Muslim is not going to be able to do all the, all the things that he had to do to get that money. Because we have limits. Okay? And so, hobbies. Islamic hobbies. Okay, this is an important thing. Culture. Even making pottery. Okay, designing things. The Muslims used to design. Go to some of the Muslim countries. Go to Syria. Go to uh, uh, Bornu in the uh, eastern part of, of, of Nigeria. Go to Morocco. Go to some parts of Pakistan. And look, even in the furniture, there's Islamic design. In the clothing, there's Islamic design. We had this before. We had a taste for Islam where our Islam appeared in everything that we were doing. Even in food that is given out to you. Even, you know, we used to have these, these real ritual things that they might seem trivial. But even serving tea and coffee to each other. How do you serve a guest and serve coffee to your guests and tea? Somebody comes to your house in Miami and they're sitting down. Okay? What do they need? Especially if they come from Canada. They need a drink of water. Get them some water. Right? So you shouldn't even say anything. You should be bringing water. That's Islamic adab. What, what do our children know? Somebody comes in, you sit down, turn on the TV. He's dying, he's thirsty, and suddenly he says, uh, can I have a drink of water, brother? And then you say, oh, yeah, 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 there's a guest here. Because the TV captured you, right? But the etiquette of Islam now deals with your guest. You know, see his health, see what he needs or she needs, take care of them, right? These are little things, but this is our culture. That's what it spread Islam. That's why Islam spread across the Niger River and, and, and into Hausa land and all the areas. That's why it spread in Indonesia. That's why Indonesia is the largest Muslim country. It was merchants that went to Indonesia. In India itself, the Hindus were influenced by Muslims. All throughout the world, it, it is really the merchants and the scholars and the people of character who spread Islam. The next point is we need practical recreation. We need to have along in our classes, we even took a period of time in our Sunday school classes, just showing you our example. We would teach Sira, we would teach some Quran, we would teach some Hadith, and then we had wrestling class. Wrestling. So you separate the boys and you separate the girls. Okay, and the girls, the boys would do wrestling. And we get a Muslim brother who's good in wrestling or good in martial arts, and he teaches them. So they have sports, right? That's what they love. The girls, too, need sports. Some people say, well, wait a minute. No, the girls need sports, too. You look at the Sahabiyat. Read about the Battle of the Trench. And read about Muslim women. You see, they, were, they fought also. They knew how to fight. They lived a tough life also. In Toronto, we had a rapist who was targeting Muslim women. Only Muslim women he loved. And so we started Wendo classes, which is women's self-defense. And a woman comes in, and she teaches the sisters they can still wear loose clothing. And she teaches them how to defend themselves if a rapist comes, how you defend yourself, what you do. And even at the end of the course, the sister broke the board and said, Sister Zaina broke the board in May 22, 1998. And some sisters, as you may have heard before I said this, some sisters put it over their bed, in their bedroom. 
So next time they got into an argument with their husband, he looked at the board. <laughs> and he said, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. Wa amruhum shura bainahum. We will solve our problem in mutual consultation. Right? He looked at the board. That's Zainab. Right? So practical uh, recreation. Riding, horse riding. Take them sometimes for horse riding. I saw a store here in Miami where they were selling saddles and whatnot. Go outside of the city of Miami and you find some people, you know, they're fishing, they're horse riding, they're hunting. Take the Muslims hunting. These are our skills, right? Swimming. Let them swim. Even the sisters, you can get an area, get a beach area or something, and let the sisters be in an area. They can still wear, you know, some parts of their clothing. They don't have to wear the clothing of the other people. And they can go inside that area. Brothers protect the area and let them swim. What we did is that we even worked with the, with the city of Toronto and we got pools, swimming pools, and we had only women in the pools, only Muslim sisters. And we had some sisters who learned from women. They took lifeguard courses. So the Muslim sisters were in the pool and they were able to swim in the pools and they learned to swim. These are some practical points that we need to have to supplement our, um, our education. Number three, as I said, skills training. And that can include um, carpentry, agriculture, home economics, and so forth and so on. So I want to leave you with these points. And um, you know, it is a challenge that we have in front of us. But really, um, in this coming period, that, 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 you know, in this time which is, which is uh, coming on us so rapidly, we need to have the type of leadership that can handle the challenges of the 21st century. It is that leadership, in summary, which has proper knowledge of Islam and has taqwa. Also, leadership that has balance and wisdom. Balance, hikmah, wisdom. Three, they have Islamic character. Four, courage and conviction. Five, a knowledge of the environment. Six, emphasis on unity and cooperation with others. Unity, type of leadership that emphasizes unity and cooperation. And seven, a positive approach. As the Prophet peace upon him used to say to his followers when he would send them out, yassiru wa la tu'assiru, bashiru wa la tunafiru. Make things easy. Don't make it difficult. Call them to what's good. Call them to Islam. Don't drive people away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us in the coming of the 21st century. And may Allah develop the type of um, Muslim homes and Islamic education that we need to present a dynamic system for not only for the Muslim world, but for the whole of the planet Earth. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li walakum wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do you accept the questions, brother? Yeah, sure. Any questions?